I'd like to begin by asking you to raise your hand if you think sex feels good. I knew this bit was going to be fun. Um, okay, so I can see most of you have raised your hands, although not all, which is interesting. Um, but did you know that we don't need sex? Did you know that in the history of all humanity, no one has ever died from a lack of sex? This is something that a young woman I've worked with taught me, but I'll come back to that a little bit later. In 2011, I decided that I was going to leave my job because I wanted to revolutionize education. I was going to change the whole UK curriculum. Um, it sounds a little bit crazy, I know, because my mum still asks me almost five years on when I'm going to go out and get a proper job. But um, it's something that I just knew needed to be done, and I was sure I wanted to do it. I wasn't entirely sure how I was going to do it, um, maybe start up a charity or some other kind of organization, I don't know. But I started by reflecting on my own schooling journey. And I started thinking about the lessons I had learned at school and the lessons that I didn't learn at school. And it was clear in my mind, at least, that gaps exist in almost any subject at school. So whether it be the absence of relationship education in sex and relationship education, or the lack of positive African stories in history lessons, or the fact that in English, I was taught very much how to write, but not really how to speak. And while speaking, presenting, and pitching have become essential to my professional development, these are skills that weren't really nurtured by academia. In fact, I was the girl at the back of the class always being told to stop talking. So while frustrations with schooling are things that most of us can relate to, it does tend to be certain sections of society who are impacted the hardest by inadequacies in public services. It tends to be young people from low-income households, those from ethnic minority backgrounds, and also children from single-parent families who are least likely to leave school fully equipped for success in adult life. Now, these are challenges that are well-known, and there are thousands of charities which exist across the UK and around the world to address these challenges. So why did I feel the need to start up another one? And the short answer is that I didn't. I want you to think for a moment about what comes to mind when you think of charity. Get some images in your mind. It's probably something like this. It tends to be images of people with their hands out. And those hands tend to be of little black and brown children. When you dig a little bit deeper, the words that usually come up are giving, help, aid, the poor, even tolerance. Charity almost depends on sympathy. It requires those with having pity on those without. But the problem for me is that I wasn't ever driven by sympathy. I was driven by personal experience, and if not my own experiences, then those of my family, my friends, and my peers. And I'm sure that none of those people were looking for a handout. So I was sure I wanted to do something, I wanted to do something good, but I wasn't sure that it was charity. And for me, the answer was in social enterprise. When I thought of charity, I thought of giving, and I'm not really sure that I necessarily have anything to give. But when I thought of social enterprise, I thought this could be a platform on which people could build themselves. So, in 2011, I founded Beyond the Classroom, which is an education social enterprise, and our flagship initiative is our Girlhood to Womanhood program, where we work with small groups of girls to explore challenges that they come up with themselves, um, and we explore those challenges through the creation of a theatre production. And the sort of things that come up time and, get, time and time again are, when should I lose my virginity? Who should I lose my virginity to? Should I send this naked picture of myself to the boy that I like? And if I do, will it make him like me too? But also, for girls growing up into young women, am I good enough to be a doctor, or should I just settle for being a nurse? So we explore these themes through the creation of a theatre production, and then they perform that production to their peers. And we also train them to become peer mentors to younger girls in their schools and in their communities because our work is founded very much on the notion that young people have the power to impact their own social challenges. And sometimes, we just need to move out of the way. So, before I start any Girlhood to Womanhood program, I tell myself a few things. 
The first thing I tell myself is that it's not about me. It's not about whatever I feel I may have to give or the warm, fuzzy feeling I may get from giving. Secondly, I tell myself that people are not disadvantaged, but instead that they have challenges and barriers. And when these things are removed, everyone has the propensity to be excellent. And lastly, I ask myself, at the end of this project, at the end of this program, do the young people I'm working with have the potential to do my job and to do it better than me if they so wished? Now, after almost five years, we've worked with over 500 young people across eight London boroughs. And I want you to meet Abby, Beryl, and Zoe. After working with us for roughly a year, Zoe described completing the program as the point at which she started to trust herself. She's also the one that taught me that no one ever died from a lack of sex. And that actually, it's the absence of love that we die from. Now, I told my brother what Zoe said, and he said, mm, I'm not sure, I think I've come close to dying once or twice from not having sex. <laughs> and then I told my mum, I said, Mum, do you know what your son just said? And she said, well, the only way he could possibly have come close to dying is if he was attempting suicide at the time. I love my family. Um, so I'm sure that lessons like this need to be taught a lot more broadly um, through our education system and that the distribution of free condoms just isn't enough. And that's all some young people get when it comes to sex and relationship education um, through our schooling system at the moment. There are tens of definitions for social enterprise. Um, but for me, I just feel that I found a comfortable place in which I could create the impact that I really wanted to, a place that I didn't necessarily feel that charity offered me. But this is not to say that charity is bad. And it's actually a charity that introduced me to social enterprise in the first place. And I'm really proud of all of the partnerships and relationships that I have with incredible charities. And I'm sure, I'm certain, that charity and the charity sector in itself will continue to have an essential role in the work that we do at Beyond the Classroom. But I would like to propose that we think a little bit more deeply about the psychology of the person or people on the receiving end of our goodwill. And that rather than giving, we consider investing. Because when you invest in something, you begin with the knowledge that that thing or that person has a value, right? And that if you invest in that value, that it will grow. And that there is a return for you, for it or them, but also for the wider society and economy in which we live. So instead of making a donation, why not buy tissues from that lady that walks up and down the train? Instead of sponsoring a child in Africa, why not go on holiday to Ghana or Senegal? Africa is a really beautiful continent, you might be surprised. Make more Zoes who might teach you a thing or two that you hadn't previously considered. Now, social enterprise has encouraged me to innovate to challenge the problems that I see around me and to question the status quo. So I'm glad, at least, that my disobedience, at least in, in this sector, has brought me to the front of the class and beyond. Thank you. <laughs>